This film is directed to everyone actively engaged in handling liquid oxygen, or LOX, as it is commonly called. LOX is one of the prime oxidizers used in the Air Force's inventory of missiles. Although liquid oxygen is our subject, the handling of liquid nitrogen will also be covered, since all procedures and safety precautions for working with this cryogenic liquid are the same as for LOX. The only difference is that liquid nitrogen is inert, does not support combustion, and is normally used for pressurization purposes. The liquid oxygen system at a typical Air Force base will include a generating plant like this one, in which the liquid is manufactured by the compression, expansion, and cooling of air taken from the atmosphere. Once manufactured, it is a cryogenic material. A cryogenic refers to the handling of low temperature materials. The temperature of liquid oxygen is 297 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. Now in addition to the LOX generating plant and mobile containers like this transporter trailer for taking the liquid oxygen from one place to another, the propellant systems plant at any Air Force base will also include LOX storage tanks at each launch site in which the LOX can be kept until it may be used or transferred for disposal. There is also a laboratory in which LOX is tested to be sure it is up to specifications, free of contaminants. And finally, there is a propellant disposal area, usually an open depression like this, in which the contaminated LOX may be safely disposed of. Liquid oxygen is a pale blue, clear liquid that flows like water. There are three major hazards involved in its handling. First, because it is so cold, 297 or more degrees below zero, remember, it will burn you severely on contact with your skin. For this reason, impregnated asbestos gloves must always be worn when working with locks. These should be loose fitting for quick removal. Other protective clothing includes a safety hood or face shield, flame resistant coveralls impervious to locks, and rubber boots with pants legs worn outside and over the boot tops. If you're working with liquid oxygen or nitrogen, handle everything with care. And be sure you know where the nearest emergency shower and eye bath is, just in case any of it contacts your skin or eyes. Wash the affected areas at once with large quantities of water. This will heat the skin and may prevent blindness or permanent disfigurement. The second hazard involved in handling LOX results from the fact that, in spite of its cold temperature, it is an oxidizer, a material capable of producing or supporting combustion. LOX supports and even accelerates combustion. It is therefore a fire hazard. Furthermore, the gel formed by liquid oxygen with certain organic materials, called hydrocarbons, is an extremely explosive hazard if subjected to shock or to ignition. The explosive potential of well-mixed gel is approximately that of nitroglycerin. Carbon black, paper, wood, cloth, asphalt, gasoline, kerosene type fuels, alcohol, and metal in form similar to steel wool are materials which can combine with locks to explode. They must never be permitted in any area where locks is stored. Now because of this fire and explosive hazard when locks is allowed to mix with organic materials, good housekeeping is a must in any area where locks is handled. The LOX plant and all storage areas must be kept absolutely free of any dangerous contaminants. Check your shoes or boots for metal particles or other organic material before entering. Remember, no smoking is the rule here. Strike no matches. Use no lighters in this area and use only appropriate tools like these in turning locks fittings and connecting transfer hoses. Whenever locks is being transferred, 
sufficient water must be running through the area so that should any locks leak or spill, it will be immediately washed away from the working area. And to help prevent such spills, a continual alertness for leaks or ruptures of all locks lines must be maintained. And this brings us to the third hazard in handling liquid oxygen. It cannot be contained in a closed system. Confined in this or any other container, locks will eventually vaporize, building up a tremendous pressure that no known vessel can contain. That is why there are pressure relief and vent valves on all locks lines and storage tanks. That is why all piping and transfer equipment must be designed for this specific purpose. That is why every LOX tank is vented, discharging to atmosphere, it should be noted, and never in the vicinity of combustible material. But safety factors designed into all liquid oxygen equipment do not relieve you of your responsibility in any area where LOX is handled. For losses of refrigeration or vacuum jackets, can overcome normal venting systems. TOs and other directives will be rigidly followed all the time. You will work by the book, but also use common sense when handling liquid oxygen, wearing protective clothing at all times, handling even small quantities of locks with care, washing down any spillage that occurs with plenty of water. There will be no smoking, sparks, or open flame in any area where LOX is handled. When they are designated, only non-sparking tools will be used. The area will be kept absolutely clean, free of contaminating organic materials with which LOX might mix to cause a fire or explosion. LOX will never be stored in the same area with fuels like alcohol, RP, or oils or other hydrocarbons. You will use only approved solvents or detergents in cleaning LOX equipment, and only tested and recommended packing and gasket material. LOX will never be vented or transferred over asphalt, macadam, or any other organic surfacing material. And a continual alertness for leaks or ruptures of all LOX tanks and lines will be maintained. Now with these basic rules in mind, let us see how LOX is received. Liquid oxygen or liquid nitrogen will always be received directly from the generating plant, its storage tank, or from a mobile container such as this transporter. But no matter how the LOX or liquid nitrogen may be received, the transfer procedure will always involve the same necessary steps First, the transporter must be properly grounded. Then, the prepared checklist covering all safety and standard operating procedures will be followed in all transfer operations. A minimum of two men will be present whenever LOX is transferred from one container to another. And both men will wear the required protective clothing. All equipment used in the transfer will have been cleaned with a proper solvent to remove any grease, oil, or other organic materials. All hose adapters, couplings, pressure buildup coils, and check valves must still, however, be carefully inspected for foreign particles. Then, if the equipment is clean, and if the locks is on specification or free of contaminants, the transfer hose is purged with a small amount of locks, and the first transfer can continue. Remember, use non-sparking tools only. Keep in mind that after the locks flow has started, if this equipment touches your unprotected skin, instant and severe frostbite will result. 
when the transporter has been filled with locks. The transfer operation is completed by disconnecting capping and storing the fill line and the grounding lead is disconnected. This liquid oxygen can now be delivered to the launch site. At the launch site, a second transfer will be made into the operational storage tank. This area too has been designed and constructed for maximum safety. Locks must always be drained or allowed to blow only in open areas. There must be wash down facilities here too. The liquid oxygen storage tank itself may be above or underground. In either case, a typical operational storage tank consists of an inner and an outer container separated by this annular space and having the following major components. A pressure gauge to indicate internal tank pressure. A gauge showing how much is in the tank. And a vacuum gauge calibrated in microns. The tank will also be vented, of course. And since lots will vaporize or boil off like this, escaping through the vent, all storage tanks must be refilled at regular intervals from transporters like the one we have just seen receiving locks from the generating plant. Here the second transfer is made. But first, the driver of the transporter must deliver a purity certificate for that load to the propellant's technician at the launch site. Now the transfer can begin and the trailer is grounded. The transfer hose has been purged and connected and the flow is started. Once again, it should be remembered that all safety precautions are taken here. All directives and SOPs strictly followed. All equipment free from any hazardous contamination. As the when the load has been transferred, the fill drain valve on the transporter is closed. The supply and the transfer hose liquid drain valve is opened. But be careful, for although pressure has been released, the transfer hose still contains locks and is still a hazard to personnel. Don't touch it without gloves. And should any of the liquid drain into the area, it must be washed away with plenty of water. Then, only after the transfer hose has been capped and properly stored, and all valves properly set, is the operation complete. Now, periodically during storage, and sometimes before a transfer may be made, liquid oxygen samples must be taken and various tests made to be sure that the locks meets necessary use limits and specifications. It is because of the possible buildup of contaminants within any liquid oxygen system that these regular quality control samplings continue as long as the LOX is held in storage. The sample is taken in an insulated container similar to a thermos bottle. 
Care should be taken to avoid breaking the container or splattering the locks. The container is first filled, then rinsed with the product, emptied, and refilled again with the sample for the test. The cover is vented to prevent pressure from building up inside the container. And in this way, the lock sample is delivered to the lab. At the lab, there are tests for hydrocarbons and acetylene using devices similar to this one. For hydrocarbons, the total number of parts per million by volume is indicated. And the acetylene must be less than 0.5 parts per million by volume. The sample is also tested for purity with an ORSAT. And checked with an electrolytic hygrometer for a dew point reading, giving its water content. It must be tested for solids, too. This millipore filter assembly is used to separate the solids from the liquid. And any solid contaminants found must be weighed on a chainomatic balance. The size and type of solids are determined by use of a microscope. Now what if the sample does not pass these tests? What if it falls below the standards or specifications set? When liquid oxygen does not meet specifications, it is the responsibility of propellants personnel to transfer it from the operational storage tank to a transporter for disposal. Here again, the equipment must first be properly grounded. And once again, all safety precautions taken as transfer procedures carefully follow the book and SOPs. The transfer then continues with the pressurization of the storage tank, which forces the locks into the transporter. Upon completion of transfer, the storage tank is vented. Later, it will be purged so that it can be refilled with pure locks. Now, however, the contaminated locks must be disposed of, and the trailer is driven away from the launch site to the disposal area, which might be an open depression like this, or even a stream, which is free of combustible material, into which the contaminated locks can be dumped so that it will evaporate to the atmosphere. The contaminated transporter, like the contaminated storage tank, must then be carefully purged with hot, dry nitrogen, refilled with locks or nitrogen, and samples again taken. If the samples meet specifications, it can then be returned to service and used again to transport locks from the supply source to the operational storage tank at the launch emplacement. Wherever and whenever you work with locks, remember all the rules. Stay on your toes.
and be careful. Know and follow standard operating procedures. That's the only way you can do your job effectively, protecting not only yourself, but every other member of your team.